I'm going to give a little presentation about the thinking that goes into dynamic character design. It's not, it was, strikingly enough, to be a really good character designer, it, it's not just about sitting down with a pencil on paper and just letting it flow. You can do that. That's fun. And it's a great place to just kind of goof around and kind of get the creative juices flowing. But how do we take those little doodles and turn them into something really, really special? Uh, because ultimately, what we're talking about is the commodification of our talent. We're talking about taking our skills, you know, I, I'm going to assume that you don't want to be a fine arts student where you're going to paint and express yourself freely with the ether, with the paint and the canvas, etc. You actually want to work in games or film or animation. Well, what we do here at USV is we train you on how to take your skills and turn them into a commodifiable skill where you can take it. And also, especially in our games and our DA department, there's a lot of crossover, and there are various aspects. You have 3D modeling, 3D animation, and then we actually go into um, concept design. And so concept design is where it all starts. This is where the ideas are developed, because if you don't have a solid concept uh, from the get-go, if you don't have a good foundation, you're not going to succeed very well in modeling and animating and presenting it to the public. So I'm going to show you... Uh, through this presentation, we'll have a, a couple of little exercises going on, uh, a, a couple of techniques that will help you and ways of thinking. Three. So let We're going to take you through step by step. And in the end, after this lecture, what I'm going to do is we're going to work together to develop a character. You guys are going to kind of help me. You know, I'm going to ask you uh, uh, right in the chat window, give me an idea for this, give me an idea for that. And I'm going to draw it in real time for you just so you can see how it's applied. All these things that I'm going to talk about, how they're actually applied into a character's design. All right. So let's begin. So what is character? Is character about plot? No, it is not about plot. The plot has nothing to do with the character. The characters, in, you know, a lot of people think, like, and it's a little confusing, right? Because if you watch a movie that's, you know, titled Indiana Jones and, and the main character's name is Indiana Jones, it's kind of hard. Like, well, wait a minute. Is that the same thing? Is the character the same as the plot? Or Harry Potter, is that the same thing? No, it's not. Stephen King, the great horror writer, actually had a really great quote, which is the situation comes first. The characters come next, and then you begin to narrate, narrate with plot. That's true for films, comics, games, television, all of it. You come up with an idea of the situation. So, for an example, um, uh, 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 there is, you know, for example, there is a world where magic exists and people grow up with magic as an everyday thing. And there's a school where they learn how to control it. That's the situation. Next, you say, well, who's in that world? Well, there's this little boy who's an orphan and he lives under the stairs with his aunt and uncle who hate magic. Then there's this girl who grew up with parents who are not magical, but she's incredibly magical and very, very smart. And you have this young boy who is kind of a middle child in this gigantic family of magicians. And he's kind of not so good with his magic, but he's not terrible at it either, but he really has a big heart. And you get these three together and you've got Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, and uh, Ron Weasley running around in the world of Harry Potter. Then what happens? Then you start developing the plot. Well, first they meet at school. And then while they meet at school, they realize that something um, is going amiss behind the scenes at the school. And then they enter into the first story of the Sorcerer's Stone or the Philosoph Philosopher's Stone for all you UK residents out there. Okay, So that's kind of an example of how you develop the situation first, then you have characters, then you have plot. Okay. So a situation, here's another example, Toy Story. The situation is, what if toys came alive and we, when we weren't looking? Who are the characters? Well, one is a boy's beloved talking cowboy doll, which is Woody. And next is his brand new space hero action figure, Buzz. The plot develops when Woody's jealousy of the newest toy in Andy's room causes him to put Buzz in danger. And his guilt forces him to try and make things right when he screws things up pretty badly. Okay, so that's Toy Story. Here's the next, here's the next stop. Who are you doing your property for? 
are you making your character for really little kids, medium level kids, teenagers, adults, really old people? It matters because what you're doing is that you are catering to different expectations. Little kids have different expectations. Um, it's amazing. I have a daughter. She's 10 years old. Her name is Emma. And she has rapidly gone from, oh boy, I love these types of cartoons that I used to watch on TV, to I'm watching Heartstopper, which is a very, uh, um, you know, very tween adult situation. And she loves it and we encourage it. But the thing is, is that that transition happened very, very quickly. And she's no longer interested in those cartoons. She has moved on to other things. So you have to understand that when you're developing characters, you're developing for a specific audience. Sometimes you can actually reach a wide audience. And that's, that's when you hit gold. Like Harry Potter, those, t those particular characters actually worked out well for a whole scope of different audiences because they found the sweet spot where ev they could, everybody could find something that would appeal to them. As opposed to Rick and Morty, which is very adult oriented, and we have with foul mouth characters, lots of poop humor, etc. That makes it a little bit difficult. So, and some people might actually find the design of Rick and Morty kind of scary. I remember my daughter Emma actually being kind of terrified of Rick Sanchez. It's right, Morty. It's kind of scary. He's got big buggy eyes. <laughs> Just don't worry about it. So it's a lot different than kind of the roly poly character of Bing Bong from uh, uh, inside out so you have to deal with appeal and how you do that is you have to understand who your audience is who are you making this for so here's an example if you're aiming your character at the right target audience you're going to receive mass appeal so you got mike wazowski totally appealing to everybody he's round he's roly-poly he's appealing to kids he's appealing to teens because he has a certain amount of monstrosity to him he's humorous enough for older older adults he's adult enough for adults and he also appeals to older generations because he's not super scary so you get this nice breadth as opposed to this monster design if you aim your character the wrong audience your properties are going to last very long so most kids aren't going to want basil wolverton's you know lena hyena here so you have to be careful about where you aim your character designs to, right? So where do you start? You want to design a character. Where do you start? Well, again, you start with the situation. Let's say you've got your situation down, but how do you develop the character for it? Well, let's get into it. I have a technique that I refer to as temenos. It's Greek. It means a place of safety. Uh, police officers use a technique, what they call leave it, you know, leave the badge in the locker because police officers um, experience an awful lot of the worst of humanity and the best of humanity. They go through the extremes, but they don't want to take that home with them. They don't want to they don't want to have all that ook attached to them all whole time. So what they do is they actually go through a little bit of a mental ritual of taking off the uniform, putting it in the locker and leaving the officer that they are as much as they can in that locker. The same thing happens when they put on the uniform. They leave the family the family man or woman or non-binary person behind in that locker while they are wearing that uniform and serving uh, serving the community. So what we they go through something very similar where they find a place of safety. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find a place of safety, meaning we're gonna know this character inside out. And what you do is use this sheet here. It's called a Temenos sheet, and you basically develop your character. So the first thing you start is an occupation, meaning what does your character do for a living? Or what role, you know, how do they occupy their time to sustain themselves in the world? Next, you have the role, which is what that character is to the world around them. How do they affect the world around them? Next is a need. The need is an objective that will fulfill that character's soul. That, that character needs to do something. They just feel this inexplicable pull. This is so important. As a matter of fact, there's actually a term used in animation. It's called the I need or I wish song in most Disney movies where the character sings their heart out going, I need to go out there and read books or I wish they would understand me in some way. And there's always some sort of routine like that. Almost every character has that moment. Next is a foible. In order to make a character believable, they can't be perfect. No one is perfect. 
in Middle Eastern societies, when they make rugs, they actually weave in an imperfection on purpose into a pattern on a Persian rug, because to their mind, only God is capable of perfection. So no one is perfect. Everybody has a foible, whether it's a bad habit or a frailty or a failing that keeps them from being perfect. Now, why would you want to do this? Because it makes the character relatable. We're not perfect. And it's nice to actually see someone fall down on the screen. Like at first they, they you know, it's when we watch a Marvel movie, it's one, you know, most of those heroes have a moment when they're trying to do something, they're big, they're powerful, and yet they trip and fall over or they get bested verbally by somebody. They've got a foible. And that makes us believe their superpowers even more because they're fallible. Okay. <clears throat> Next is their virtue. It's something that keeps that character relatable and likable for an audience, but it also keeps their frailty, their foible from taking over their lives. Tony Stark, as an example, Iron Man. Tony Stark is an alcoholic and a, a person who suffers from PTSD in the comics and in the films. And the thing is, is that his virtue is that he does actually have a heart of gold. He wants to do right by people. And that keeps him from just being a raging alcoholic and a jerk and an abuser, right? So that creates a balance in that character, right? Next is activities. These are things that characters do to support the need that they have. So if your character needs music in their life, what kind of activities would they be going into? Probably taking music lessons, probably maintaining their musical instrument, going to concerts, going to record stores, downloading music, listening, talking to other musicians, performing outside, etc. And finally, we get to theme, and this is the overall meaning that the character brings to a story. This is, this is what they contribute to the, the, the entire story. And I have an example here. If this is a little confusing, let's take Woody. Woody, his occupation is he's a toy. That's it. Pretty simple. But what's his role? It's different. His occupation may be a toy, but his role is he's a companion to Andy the kid who loves him and he's a leader of the other toys in the toy box in Andy's room, right? What's his need? He's got two of them. One is to be loved and he has a very deep seated one, which is to be Andy's favorite toy. And that's his need. Now what's his foible? His foible is jealousy. He gets jealous really easy when a new toy shows up. You can see him. He actually has an, uh, in the first toy story movie, he has a little bit of a panic attack. Like, what's this? What's this? It's a new toy. It's all good. It's all good. I still have the place on Andy's bed. It's all good. And because of that, he's also a control freak. He wants to manage all the toys, make sure that they operate on schedule, especially in Andy's birthday, that kind of thing. But what's his virtue? Ultimately, he wants to do what's right. He wants to do the right thing. Even though his foible overcomes him every once in a while, like pushing Buzz out the window in Toy Story 1, Ultimately, he's got to do the right thing. What are his activities? Well, he bosses other toys around. He organizes Andy's room into an inch of its life. He acts as the leader as much as needed. And the thing is, is he, here's, here's one of his other activities. Not all activities are good. One of his activities is actually associated with the foible. He actually sabotages other toys' rise to prominence in order to maintain his need, which is to be Andy's favorite. The theme of, of Woody, ultimately, is abandonment and people pleasing. Andy at some point is going to stop playing with him. And he knows this, he knows that moment is coming. So he's trying to put that off as long as possible and make Andy happy. When he finally comes to terms with that, it takes him two or three movies to finally come to terms with that. But through most of his existence, he's so worried that Andy is not gonna want to play with him anymore and, not, and he will no longer be Andy's favorite toy that it pretty much defines everything about him. And it also sets the scene, it sets the theme and the tone for the rest of the story. Okay, so that's how you use a Temenos. But we have to start with a character by building an archetype. And I want to make sure that we draw a distinction here between archetype and stereotype. They are not the same thing, okay? They sound the same, but they're not the same. An archetype, like uh, Sanjay from Sanjay Super Team from Pixar, it reveals a connection to human nature, a true 
general connection to human nature. Whereas a stereotype, it actually um, creates a, you know, it, it conceals the complexity of an individual by being too general. So Apu from The Simpsons is very much a stereotype as opposed to Sanjay, who is an archetype. The archetype in this case would be son and father, dreamer, believer, etc. right? That's an archetype. As opposed to this person, these types of people do this, this type of person does that, that type of person is like this. Those are all generalizations. And stereotypes don't even necessarily need to just boil down to racism or homophobia. They can be very subtle and very insidious. And we have to be careful about this because it leads us down a very slippery slope when it comes to developing characters for our stories, especially these days when we are actually trying to have a lot more equality and equity in our product. So how do we develop an archetype? Well, I found a wheel here that's actually kind of helpful here. As you can see, we've got one, two, we got 12 different major archetypes. There are themes that go with them. And then they kind of cluster together into sections of three. So you have the innocent, and their theme is safety. You have the sage, and their theme is knowledge. You have explorer, which is the theme is freedom. The outlaw, which is about liberation. The magician, which is about power. The hero is about mastery. The lover is about intimacy. The jester is about pleasure. The everyman is about belonging. The caregiver is about service. And the ruler is about control. And lastly, the artist is about innovation. And you can see these four major elements. These become plot devices later on. When you have the right characters, that can help you develop your plot. So if you have an innocent, a sage, and explorer in your group, at some point, like if, if these characters are your main character, your story is probably going to be about a spiritual journey. If you have an outlaw, a magician, or a hero, they, their pursuit and their theme is going to be about leaving a mark on the world, making an impression, becoming the best of the best, right? If you have a jester, a lover, or an everyman, their theme is going to be about connection to others. And lastly, when you have a caregiver, a ruler, or an artist, it's about providing structure for the world, changing the world. I'm going to change the world in some special way by giving it some sort of new structure or revising an existing structure. Okay, so that's archetypes. Now, I'm going to complicate things a little bit more because I'm going to show you some examples. We're going to do an experiment. You don't necessarily have to draw this, but if you have a pen and paper, go ahead and grab it. Grab a pencil, grab a piece of paper. You don't need to show it off. You don't need to scan it, whatever. But what we're going to do is we're going to draw a princess. And you could just do this in your head. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys three minutes. And you're going to draw a princess. Okay. So I'm going to start the timer. And here we go. You got three minutes. Draw in your mind what an archetype of a princess will be. Um, and I'm going to switch over to my Photoshop because I'm going to ask you a question. Take a look at your princess. This is this is as far as you know, this is, you know, to you, your mind, it is princess. But let me ask you a question. Did your princess look something like this? Hang on a second, make sure I've got my settings going. Here we go. Oop. Be nice if I had a color. Did your princess look like this? Probably not. That's not specific enough, right? Well, what's going to make it a princess? Well, let's be honest here. We got to be careful about, remember me telling you, you got to choose your audience. So I think here's an experiment. Uh, maybe if you're from one part of the world or you've had a one particular cultural experience, maybe your princess looks something like this. So maybe your princess looks something like this. Okay, maybe, maybe not. 
what if your princess looks something a little bit more like this? How about this one? Uh, oh, I know. Hmm. Maybe your princess looks something like this. And you have to have like little birds flying around and that kind of stuff, right? Little Disney princess kind of thing. <clears throat> but what if, here's another, here's another question. What if your princess looks something more like this? Totally different, right? And yet, it's still a princess because it fits within an archetype. Okay, I got one last one for you. Up, it's a total Princess Leia, right? Okay, so you've got all of these are different. How many of you had something close to one of these? I'm willing to bet. Yeah, you, something close, right? But not exact. That's the thing about archetypes. You avoid the specific. Because if you start adding more and more details, you get a mess, right? <laughs> but if you, you start off with a base, it's a great place to start. Now, once you figure out what your archetype is, believe it or not, archetypes are actually related to shapes. You start off with very simple shapes whenever you draw anything. I used to have a drawing instructor in college, and he loved to sing shapes, shapes, simple shapes. Just to remind you, everything starts with simple shapes. He was a terrible songwriter, but I remembered it. And over here, you can see that even Disney animators use shape language to establish archetypes and character and personality within a figure so if you look at aladdin here aladdin is very bottom heavy with his big poofy pants same thing with jasmine she also has the poofy pants they kind of have these classical hourglass figures but look at the sultan he's just kind of, he looks like a peanut you know with one on the top and one on the bottom he's very he's shaped like a legume he's round he's friendly but then you look at jafar he's a lot he's broad shoulders and he's lots of sharp points all over him genie looks like a puff of smoke that was the inspiration for him it's just like this little thought balloon and then carpet is just a square it's kind of a rectangle and each character by establishing a shape language starting with very very simple shapes helps you establish their personalities and also helps the viewer to read them at a glance for a good example of this are the characters from inside out Anger has a very dis distinct shape. Joy has a very distinct shape. Uh, depression has a very distinct shape. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Round shapes, they suggest a character is soft and friendly. But let's turn and fluffle. 
you have square shapes, which makes a character is stable and he's strong. Triangles suggest a character is dangerous. Once you figure out what the basic shape, really simple shapes, now you have to develop the silhouette. So don't worry about details when you're starting off. Just establish that basic shape and then make sure that your character reads well in silhouette. These are some obvious silhouettes here. You've got Mickey, Daffy Duck, Fred Flintstone, Ren and Stimpy, etc. They're easy to read in silhouette, but what makes a good readable silhouette? Well, let's do an experiment. Let me ask you right off the bat in the chat window, who is this? Just write who you think this is right off the bat. People are stumped, right? What's the problem here? The problem is there's not enough information. <laughs> nice, Rachel, a homo sapien. Very good. Okay. Well, let's see what happens. Well, is it really Spider-Man? I don't know. Could be. Let's add a little detail and see who it becomes this time. Now, who is it? Is this enough detail to figure out who this is? Who do you think this is, guys? A tiefling? Okay, could be a tiefling. <laughs> okay. Darcides, okay. Maybe it's Daredevil, could be Wolverine, but I don't think it's Wolverine. Maybe we need, need some more detail. Let's add some more detail to this and develop those shapes a little bit better. Now it's Wolverine, right? It's a lot more obvious. How about this one? Let's add some more detail. Oh, we got a problem here. We've added Kate. So is this really who you think it is? It could be Superman. It could be Ultraman. It could be a lot of characters. There's not enough detail here. So you have to be careful when you start adding silhouette, you know, details to the silhouette. It could be the length of the cape. It could be the amount of cape. Sometimes it's even the shape of the cape. Like our next example. Maybe you put some scalloped edges and you add some claws. Now it's Batman. A Batman. Right? But you got to be careful. Don't add too much detail because the silhouette of your character will get harder and harder to read. Right? So maybe it's Deadpool, but I don't know. Some of those details, it's very Rob Layfeld. A lot of characters in the 90s in comic books were really hard to read silhouette-wise because they all had the giant shoulder pads. They all had extra bags and pouches. <laughs> Thanks, man. So what you do is when you develop a character, start off with doodles. Remember me saying at the very beginning of this, you start off with some doodles? Totally fine. Get some general ideas going on here, and you'll start to see some things develop here. These are the designs for Up. This is Carl Fredrickson, the character, grumpy old man character from Up. And this is where it started. It started with these rough little doodles, okay? But over time, the animators started developing and getting more specific. They started going, okay, what makes an archetypical old man? Hunched over, Kind of, you know, a wobbly neck thing going on, a big chin, a big nose, big ears, hair growing out of his ears, that kind of stuff. Very simple, very easy to read. It still has a very decent solid silhouette. But then you start developing it. One of the things that, that they did on Up is they decided to make Carl implacable. You know, like when you have Russell asking him, like, can I come in? Can I help you with anything? No. He's like, yell at him, no. And the whole point is that he wanted to be stable he's like i'm gonna stay where i am and i'm not gonna do anything different and how they did that is they turned him into a cube they made him square shaped and ellie was balloon shaped his wife and then russell was also round and balloon shaped so anybody who was trying to convince him to be free and happy and have adventure was round but he himself was square until you finally get to your final designs that you can start developing a turnaround sheet and handing off to your animators and your modelers over at Pixar. When you have design, what you want to do is work loose when you're starting off. Just work as loose and as free as possible. Don't worry about getting it right the first time. Sometimes it takes hundreds of designs. On Hotel Transylvania, I think they went through four dozen basic character designs just for Dracula to get it right until they finally started nailing it down. So when you try to be precise, when you start, you can burn away all the appeal of your character. 
right? So this is an early sketch by Chris Sanders of Lilo and Stitch. And you can tell that Stitch isn't quite right. He's still a little kind of creepy and animal-like. He doesn't have all that appeal yet, but he's almost there. He's almost there, just, but he's working loose still. This is actually an early watercolor design that he used to pitch the movie at a luau. Break it down. Break your character down into basic shapes. It's highly unlikely that you'll be the only artist working on your project, unless you're doing your own comic book, right? So you could develop it, but it's good to have this anyway for reference. Break it down to basic shapes. Make it anybody, easy for any, excuse me, easy for anybody to draw your character or model it. Your design process will take a lot of work. If you really want a good solid character design, try to draw every possible angle of your character. This is going to be valuable in both 2D and in 3D animation. All right, so here's an example of Milo from Atlantis in which the animator actually sat down and did a 360 degree turn on Milo. Pretty fascinating. Also, think of all the stuff that comes with a character. I mean, when you think of Mickey Mouse, what's the first thing you think of as far as stuff for Mickey Mouse? The red shorts with the buttons on the front, the yellow shoes and the white gloves, right? Well, somebody had to design that. That was Ubi Works. But in other characters' cases, they need to come with their own stuff. So whether it's tribal masks or spears or laser guns or whatever it is, take care in designing them. Because if a character is designed one way and they're covered in accoutrement that's designed another, it's going to ruin the fabric of that world. It's very easy to throw the audience's um, ability to believe in what you're doing. It's, it's very easy to throw it off. So you have to be careful with this. So refine it as much as you can. Define, refine, define, and get into construction. This is the, this is the level of detail that they would get into at the early Disney uh, studio cartoons. So here's Goofy. And you can see how they would break it down to basic shapes. They make all these notes like don't make the nose too big. Don't do this with his upper lip. Do this with his upper lip. Set up a list of do's and don'ts. Put them on your character design sheet saying, don't ever draw my character like this. It'll ruin the look, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay. Also, visually explain how your character is going to emote. It's always good to have a character sheet that involves uh, expressions. So how does a character laugh? How do they cry? How do they choke? How do they look surprised? How do they smile? Are there different types of smiles? You bet there are. So here's a great one. It's Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio. I love this character expression sheet because there's so many variations of how he looks. I just adore it. So try to think how they move, how they act, how they emote, and how they think. Okay, next comes another, another possibility, getting more details, which is color. Just like there's a shape language, there is a color language. So color says everything about your character. When you think of Pixar movies, they are generally not monochromatic and dull and gritty, right? They leave that up to the DCU, right? But Pixar tends to have bright, colorful characters. Like even in Brave, there's a lot of bright colors. I mean, all you have to uh, col uh, bright colors. Think of Merida's hair and her eyes, right? She stands out. Even the bears stand out because of the color choices that they have in Brave. So let's let's do a little experimentation here about color. Color is as much about emotion as it is about aesthetics. It's not just about, well, it looks cool because it's yellow. It's like, well, why does it look good? So let's do a quick little review on color. You have the primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue. Those are the primary colors. Then you have what are called the secondary colors, which are the colors in between, direct, you know, perfectly in between all the primary colors. Those are violet, orange, and um, okay. Violet, orange, and green. Then you have the tertiary colors. I'm sorry. Then you have the tertiary colors, which are the colors in between a primary and a secondary color. So for example, you have red as a primary, orange as a secondary, and between them, you have a tertiary color, which is red-orange. Then you have yellow-orange, yellow-green, blue-green, blue-violet, red-violet. Understanding this helps, uh, helps you define the color of a character and 
how that color can affect a character and how the audience perceives that character. Okay. So believe it or not, we associate, human beings associate colors, all the different colors in the spectrum to different emotions. So if you look at this chart here, you can see that Cranky actually has been registered as this kind of weird salmon-y pink character, uh, color. Same thing with Aggravated, which is a little bit redder. Upset is this kind of orangey uh, color. Angry is bright red. Disgusted is purple. Sad is this cerulean blue. Hurt is a pale blue. Afraid is kind of yellowish orange. Concerned is orange. Happy, believe it or not, tends to be bright green overall. These are colors that psychologists over time have compiled. And this chart is widely used in psychology to help children be able to express their emotions by pointing to the color. How do you feel? Point to the color in which you feel. And these results were compiled to make this chart that you see here. So this is compiled with thousands of little kids going, I feel sad, I feel surprised, I feel confused by touching the color on that chart. So if you have a character that you want to view them as purely heroic, those tend to be associated with primary colors, reds, blues, yellows. Iron Man, bright red, bright gold, right? Ms. Marvel, red, blue, and yellow. She's got them all over the place. Wonder Woman, Superman, even Spider-Man has that. But, but Spider-Man's different because he has very bright colors. We'll get to that in just a minute here. If your character is a protagonist, um, you could still enhance their unpredictable nature by using secondary colors. So Hawkeye, he's unpredictable because you're not exactly sure what side he's on sometimes. So he's purple. Rocket Raccoon, he's unpredictable. He's ultimately a good guy. He's one of the Guardians, but he dresses in orange. And of course, the Hulk wears both purple and green because he's completely, you know, completely unpredictable. Hulk smash. If you want your character to be bigger than life, try bumping up the saturation of that character, like Yondo's, Yondu's bright blue skin, or Spidey's bright red on his costume, or Gamora's bright, red, uh, bright green skin. Sure, she's unpredictable, but making it bright green, it makes her mythic. If you want your character to be sinister and mysterious, add some shade to the color language. So Daredevil might be a, a red character in the comics, but they've dulled him down by taking, you know, adding so much shade to the colors uh, scheme of his costume that he's dark and mysterious with just a touch of red. Black Widow actually has a little bit of a of a blue to hue to her costume, whereas you've got um, Nick Fury here, and he actually has a little bit of an earth tone to him, but it's still very very black because it goes with his leather that he wears. It's very earth tony. If you want your character to be ethereal or otherworldly, tint your color palette to reduce the saturation. So you've got Moon Knight, which is a little bit more of the goldish hue, but it's very pale. Monica Rambeau, Captain, version of Captain Marvel. She's black and white, but she's got you know very obviously this pearlescent white. Then you have the very pearlescent white of the white version of the Vision from Vision and Scarlet Witch. It's interesting to see the spectrum of characters from Disney animated, fair, uh, animated films and where they fall on the, on the color wheel. If you look closely, you can see you've got Captain Gantu from Lilo and Stitch, Frollo, Yokai, Ursula, Mordu, and Shan Yu. They're all blacks and grays. Whereas friendly, lighthearted, innocent characters like Duchess and Pongo here are all about bright grays and you know bright pale grays and whites you have slightly untrustworthy characters here on the purple scale from dr facilier governor ratcliffe anna from frozen she's untrustworthy well just ask elsa <laughs> you know there she's pulling shenanigans so yeah she is slightly mischievous she's also royal which is i find that interesting that an untrustworthy characters tend to be also the same colors as royalty. Aladdin, wait, he's untrustworthy? Sure, he's a street rat. And he's also been lying to Jasmine the entire time, right? You have trust and loyalty, confidence and stability. You've got Stitch, Elsa, Cinderella, Hades. Whoa, wait a second. Hades? 
well, he's not necessarily trustworthy. You can trust him to be a jerk, but he's also very confident in where he is in the world, et cetera, et cetera. So we can go through this chart at any time, but this just kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of how characters can be influenced by color. So with all that in mind, we're going to create a character, okay? We're going to create a simple character, and we're going to go through our presentation step by step to kind of review uh, what our character is going to be like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start another layer in my Photoshop here real quick. Give me just a moment. There we go. There we go. And I will share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, excuse me. We need to set up our situation. Now, I don't need to go into a giant backstory or anything like that. So I'm going to use an archetype, arch, archetypical situation. So here are some examples. A Western, a gangster story, a uh, fantasy well, story, so a science this fiction. This going to be like what you're doing. Uh... I'm sorry? Rachel joined and wasn't on mute. I muted her. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so in the chat window, come up with some quick ideas. And let's see. Uh, we can do a Western. We can do horror. We can do uh, science fiction. That kind of thing. A genre. Let's pick a genre of a story. Okay. So in the chat window, everybody write in. Let's see what we get. Comedy, love story. Who else? Sci-fi, mystery. It's okay if you repeat because I think I'm going to go with majority rules. So go ahead and ch ch chime in. A genre. Comedy. Okay. Well, we got comedy. I'm waiting for like one or two more here. Type in the chat window what type of genre you think we should do comedy okay so we're gonna do a funny character we're gonna do something funny okay what would be a good archetype for our funny character now when we say archetype let me remind you that an archetype is a very broad description here are some examples of archetype descriptors a king a princess a detective a clown that kind of thing. Don't get too specific with it. A ninja, a samurai, that kind of stuff. Write a, in the chat window, everybody write a archetype that you would like to see this, this comedic character be. So write a archetype in the chat window, please. Okay, I've got a pirate, I got a princess, I got a detective, okay, alien, a bandit. Okay, cool. Anybody else? A dog, nice. Anyone else? A archetype. All right. You know what? I think I'm going to combine a couple here. And because it's a comedy, my archetype is I'm going to do, I think I actually want to do a pirate. And I'm actually going to mix it with another archetype, which is I'm going to make it a dog. So we're going to do a pirate dog as our character, all right? So if we have a pirate dog, we have to do a little Temenos here. What is, well, we already, we already defined it with our archetype here. 
a pirate is not just an archetype, it's actually his occupation. So our occupation, he's a pirate. What does our dog pirate need? What what is the ultimate need of this dog pirate? What do what fulfills their soul? Treats. Great. I'll go with the first one that pops up. Treats. At least one peg leg. <laughs> nice. Okay, treats. Because he's a dog, right? Okay. What is our dog's foible? What is the thing that makes him fallible or her? I don't have to be specific. Oh, he likes, they like cats. Sea squirrels. <laughs> nice. Too greedy. Nice. Okay, there's some interesting ones. I'm going to go, uh, I like sea squirrels. That's pretty great. Um, but I think for a foible that will really work for him or her will be greedy. Let's do greedy. Okay. But what is, you know, we actually have this. We actually have a virtue already. And I think I'm going to make the virtue of our pirate dog that they like cats. They have a soft spot for kitty cats. Unlike all the other dog pirates, oh, we hate, arr, we hate, arr, we don't like cats, arr, those, those, those darn felines on the seven seas, we hate those, arr, we're sea dogs. Arr. Okay, what kind of activities, write up some activities that our dog pirate does. What do they do to maintain their need of treats? Write some activities. What would our pirate dog do to fulfill their need for treats and the seven seas and all that? And they're also greedy. What, what would they do to support that? They beg. Okay. Give me another one. Another activity. Ah, digs for treasure. Takes food. <laughs> Fetching contracts. Love it. Chewing bones. Good. Good. This is awesome. Okay. All right. This is a really good starting point. But let me ask you something. Before we keep going any further, who is this for? What is our target audience? Is this for little kids, little teeny weeny kids? Is this for mid-level kids, like somewhere from the six, six to 12 range? Is this for teenagers? Is this for adults? Is this for old people? Or is this a general audience? So write what you think our target audience will be in the chat window. Who is our target audience? Teenagers. Six to 12. Okay, so not for little, little kids. We can get a little weird. Okay, preteens. Cool. I'm digging this. I'm digging this. Okay. Kind of like a Cartoon Network kind of thing. Okay, excellent. So we're definitely going for tweens and preteens. Pre okay, let's just go for preteens. So with that comes some expectations. So we don't want to make him too babyish, but we also don't want to make him too scary or too gross or too much. It's We don't want to go too far with all the details and so forth. Okay, so if we want our character to be funny and likable, then let me ask you something. What is the shape language? What would the shape language of our dog pirate be? If he's going to be funny or she is going to be funny. Ovalish, okay, I've got ovalish. Circles, round. Round. Okay. Round. Round roly poly for a greedy little puppy, puppy pirate. Awesome. Okay. So we, now we have built, see, like an oval with a flat head. Rachel, I like how you think. We're going to roll with that. I'm going to totally roll with this. No pun intended. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, we have done all of this here. This is your foundation. You've done all the work. See how see how fast that actually went? You know, we had all this lecture, 
It's a lot to remember, but when you ask these, ask yourself these questions, you suddenly have a really good foundation for a character. So now, do the magic of Zoom. I'm going to take all of this really quick, and I'm going to do a quick sketch of our puppy pirate so you can kind of see. Hang on a second. There we go. Lock this down. Actually, I want to turn down the opacity a little bit. And wrong one. That one. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is, is I'm going to pick a I, I do what I, what's called blue lining. It's an old comic book habit of mine. At one point during my college days, I was actually an intern for Stan the Man Lee, but that's a different story. But he definitely got me involved in uh, using blue line for my pencil work on comic books. So he taught me how to use uh, blue line pencil for this kind of stuff. So anyway, um, I am thinking in my brain, I'm going in my brain here. You're kind of going a little lexicon here of who would, you know, what dog breeds would be perfect for this type of shape language. And with a flat head, and you know what? I can immediately start thinking about just shapes. So let's just do a shape here first. A simple round ovalish shape. I'm going to kind of give myself a little bit of an eye line here. And rounds 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 but because our little guy is greedy he's bottom heavy so he's got this little round body could be a pug right he's got like little chubby little legs sticking out the side here and they always have these little chubby little dogs they have this brisket that sticks out the top here. That's their shoulder with all the little fat kind of develops over there. And they got a big head, a little flat little body. And then we give them some feet. And let's give them some front paws here. Little four legs. And pugs are cool, but the only problem with, you know what the interesting thing about pugs is? They can be interesting, but the trick with pugs is that I love them. But we'll give them a goofy tongue. We'll, we'll make a compromise. We'll go with a tongue, but I think I'm actually going to make our little guy a Frenchie. Frenzel! French Bulldog! Oh. And Frenchies have this very distinct muzzle. Got a little squishy little face. Everything is everything on their face is all centered in this little circle here in the middle of their face. So I'm gonna start with that. Get his mouth in there. Let's get his eyes. And their eyes are a little bit easier. Their eyes also bug out a lot. A little bit like a, a pug dog, but it's not nearly as extreme. Like pugs are way out there, but Frenchies still have this kind of look to it. And I think I'm going to actually have, there's his, he's got a little double chin because he's a greedy little puppy. And we're going to give them a big tongue. I think it was Rachel. Who, oh, it was uh, May who requested a big goofy tongue. There we go. Then you have to have those ears, right? those big old Frenchy bat ears. Okay, we've got our base laid in here. I actually want to make a little bit chubbier. Get those legs sticking out. Now, does it silhouette well? Yeah, it still reads as a dog, right? And they don't have long tails, right? Frenchies have got those little nubbins sticking out their butt. So you have to have a little, boop, little nubbin sticking out there. But it's a little Frenchy. But now we're going to pirate this guy up a little bit. So let's pirate, let's, you know, actually I want to give him like little 
little canines in the, in the bottom there, some in the top. Maybe a little bit of drool coming off of that tongue because he's always had it lolling out there. But you know what's interesting about Frenchies? They've got these big bat ears that almost looks like a pirate hat right to begin with. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him, this guy, first off, give him a big old pirate earring out of one of those giant ears of his. And then let's give, on the opposite side, let's give him a little kerchief that hangs down maybe a little bit. Give him like a little pirate vest. I don't know if I want to give him an eye patch. That might be too much because I, I like his eyes. He's got a lot of appeal. But let's, there was a request for a peg leg. So let's make one of his front paws here a peg. Cool. Make it stand out. Now we can ink our little fellow. So I'm going to start another layer here real quick. And let's get... It's always good to give him like little uneven teeth. He's got big dog lips like most of them do. They have dog lips. Dog lips. That smile, that big goofy Frenchy smile. I always think Frenchy should talk like this. Let's double. Let's go for a rock. I kind of fall behind you. I made the purple. Dada, look, I made the purple for you. Get the bag. Give him his tongue. Big goofy little tongue sticking out. A little bit of drool coming off that tongue. Give him nice eyebrows. Those great Frenchy eyebrows. They've got Frenchies actually have very expressive eyebrows. Lots of wrinkles though. It's almost like his face is squeezed into that kerchief. Give him a little knot right here for his kerchief. Let's make this kerchief a little ratty because he gets into he gets into little scrapes every once in a while. And let's, let's actually put a hole. He's had an accident. It's gone right through his ear. So he's got a little hole sticking through his ear. And then we'll give him a, an earring. There we go. Let's finish off that smile. <laughs> His little ripped up vest that he wears instead of a dog collar. He's got his peg leg here. Go. He's got his tummy, got a little Frenchy tummy. He's a little greedy gut, so he's a little chubby little guy. He's pretty cool. He's got his little feet sticking out on the sides there. He's got his little nubby butt there. This is one of the dogs that when he lays down, he just spreads out like a carpet. He's just a big, lazy little pupper. Give him nice little chubby feet. Little chubby paws. And you draw in a Frenchie, you're basically drawing a human baby. It's the same proportions. Okay, so we've got our Frenchie. We've got a little pirate puppy. We're almost there. What's the next step? Well, we have to develop a, 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 a color language for this guy, right? So let's do a little color language really quick. Let's just do a quick lay-in for color. Just so we have an idea of how he's gonna how he's gonna look. 
So I'm going to turn this into a multiply layer. If he is unpredictable, is he an unpredictable guy or is he a predictable character? Type in the chat window. Is he predictable or unpredictable? Unpredictable. Okay, so we should probably work a little bit with a secondary color palette, right? And also, just to add a little bit of that, like, hint of mystery, let's make him a, a blue. There's a, a type of Frenchie that's actually kind of got bluish fur. This is one of my favorite Frenchies. I so want a French bulldog. That's one of my, one of my Christmas wishes. Okay, um, let's see. Here we go. So we're going to give him some blue fur. And all of his little feet sticking out here. Get his belly. And you notice I'm not going for 100% accuracy just yet. I'm just laying it in to see if this works. Because sometimes you'll think, yeah, I totally have it figured out. That's the color scheme I want. And then you do it, you're like, ew, I don't like that. We're going to have to change that. But let's see what happens. Let's see what happens with this guy. Boop. Get his other little feeties. <laughs> right. Okay, if he's unpredictable, then we're going to use some secondary colors. So let's use kind of a, an orangish color for his vest. Kind of earth tony. Let's use a slightly darker thing, a darker color for the peg. A little peg leg. His eyes should probably be brown. Let's go with a kind of a, a pale, a dark purple for the inside of his mouth here. And let's go with a pale for kind of a pink color for that same color for his tongue. Let's also do it for his nose. He's got a pink nose. One of those types of Frenchies. And let's get a paler gray in there for his muzzle. So it stands out. And it reads a little bit easier for him. And let's get an even paler pink for the insides of his ears. Those big bat ears of a Frenchie. And let's get some gold on his, we're almost done. Get some gold on his earring. And last but not least, let's give him a nice bright green bandana. See if that works. And it might not. We might go with purple, although I think green is going to work for, oh yeah, that's going to work. I like that. It also, remember our, our emotions and color chart? It also denotes that he's a happy dog. The green will help with his happiness. And from here, you start doing all the little tweaks and you start playing around with different ideas. Like we're gonna put some shine on his eyes to make him look a little bit more appealing and get some highlights on his eyebrows. Maybe on his tongue, he's got some reflections. It's all goobery. Eh. Some shine there, the top, etc. So there we go. We now have ourselves a little puppy pirate. We've gone through the entire process of starting off with all of this foundational work that we did earlier. And we talked about that with a long lecture. We built up a shape language and a silhouette. We started filling in defining design, you know, define, design, and refine. We added color, 
We added those extra little bits of detail. And now we have a quick preliminary, but very appealing little, little puppy pirate. A little Frenchy, little French pirate puppy. So there you go. That's that's the whole process for character design. So um thank you so much. I mean, this is that's that's the that's our presentation, folks. But I'm sure Eric has a few questions for you guys as well. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Eric and uh he'll be able to uh wrap things up for us a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Before before we do anything, can can we all give a big round of applause to Peter? That was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was such an entertaining thing to do.